Okay, so uh, welcome everybody. Uh, I'd like to begin by acknowledging the, trad to the traditional custodians of the land, wherever you may be located, and to pay my respects to elders past, present and emerging, and in particular to pay my respects to the Wabagal people of the land in which the Callahan campus resides and where we who are in the room are located today. Uh, I'd also like to thank uh, Tricia Pender and the Gender Research Network at UON more generally, who are co-hosting our uh, speaker today, and I hope it's just the first of many uh, such uh, uh, joint papers. Our speaker today, Dr. Jude Conway, was born and bred on unceded Wabagal and Waramai lands. A historian, she specializes in writing and talking about the lives and activities of groundbreaking and radical women, and women who stood out from the crowd in Newcastle and the Hunter region. Her paper today, based on a careful reading of her mother, Josephine Conway's papers, is titled Campaigning for Access to Legal and Affordable Pregnancy Terminations in the 1970s and 80s, Again and Again and Again, a Newcastle case study. Jude, over to you and I'll share your slides. Thanks, Sasha. And firstly, I also would like to pay my respects to the Awabikul people and acknowledge that their land on which I'm speaking ha has never been ceded. Now, one of the linchpins of the Newcastle women's movement was my mother, Josephine Conway. And this talk is an account of her campaigning on just one of her concerns, and that is legal access to affordable pregnancy terminations. The information has been gathered from uh, the campaign papers, which she saved, uh, interviews from some of her activist allies, and articles from mainstream and radical newspapers, and the literature about the campaigns for the right to choose to have an abortion. For Josephine, women's ability, whether or not to have a baby, was the major feminist issue because if you can't control your fertility, you can't control your life. Her interest in the area had its roots in her nursing training during World War II, when she was distressed by the number of women who contracted infections and peritonitis from illegal abortions. When Josephine was attending humanist society meetings in the late 1960s, memories of those women resurfaced because the Humanist Society Australia-wide was campaigning to legalise abortion. However, when that access began to be decriminalised, the women's movement found itself having to battle time and time again to prevent conservative Catholics and fundamental Christians from forcing limitations on or closure of the newly available access which feminists deemed a powerful challenge to male control over women. Because of the constant battles, Josephine developed a sense of outrage about the possibility of having to return to the days of backyard abortions, and this outrage fired her efforts. Josephine's activism, activism on the issue began after she joined women's electoral lobby, known as WELL, in 1972, and increased exponentially throughout the 70s and 80s, predominantly with the Right to Choose Abortion Coalition, which she co-founded in 1982 with a handful of other women, similar to the start of most pro-choice advocacy groups. Throughout the 1980s, the Right to Choose Coalition developed increasingly sophisticated campaign strategies and arguments forged networks with local feminist groups and capital city pro-choice groups, and was a consistent fundraiser for the cause. Josephine, as one of the most visible pro-choice activists in Newcastle, was often the brunt of male anger. Many women were willing to speak publicly on other feminist issues, but those who argued for the right to choose had to be particularly courageous as it was the most heated of social issues of those decades. Australia's small population and a belief in biological determinism drove government efforts from the early decades of colonisation to compel women to bear children. Laws prohibiting termination of pregnancies fell under state jurisdiction. The New South Wales law was based on the United Kingdom Act of 1861, 
In the 1960s, women began experimenting with premarital sex more widely than ever before, or wanted to bear fewer children, and they began to want access to services which had been previously prohibited. In this groundswell of demand in Western countries, the UK Act was abandoned for the Abortion Act 1967, which made termination legal if the continuation of the pregnancy would do substantial injury to physical or mental health of the mother. South Australia in 1969 was the first state here to follow suit. In Victoria that same year, the Menonib court ruling established that an abortion was lawful if it was necessary to preserve the pregnant woman from serious danger to her life or to her physical or mental health. The influence of the UK Act is obvious. In 1971, there was a trial in New South Wales against three doctors for procure, pro, sorry, procuring illegal abortions. In acquitting the defendants, Justice Levine made a similar ruling to Mennonites, but added the clause when assessing the danger to the patient's mental health. Considerations may be taken of her social and economic circumstances. This benchmark ruling decriminalised abortion in New South Wales and women no longer had to resort to backyard operators as clinics gradually opened. Newcastle was fortunate to have a sympathetic and morally courageous gynaecologist, Dr Lachlan Lang, who in 1973 established the first outpatient abortion clinic in the state at Royal Newcastle Hospital. Operating the clinic was not easy. Opposition within the hospital made the process demeaning for patients and for himself. When the hospital board closed the clinic in 1975 for being too unwieldy, Dr Lang established a clinic in the private sector, the only consistent outlet for uh, pregnancy terminations in Newcastle for the next decade and a half. The women's movement was gathering steam as these changes were occurring. And the first pro-choice campaign that Josephine was linked to was in 1973, when a bill was brought before federal parliament to legalise abortion in the ACT. When protests were staged against the bill by the Right to Life Association, Josephine contacted women's electoral lobby well in Sydney to see how she could campaign in support. Whatever she and others did, the bill was defeated and one, and one Sydney activist commented, the right to life and their cronies are a minority, but a minority with money. They were to prove a formidable enemy. The next campaign occurred in 1975 when the Infant Life Preservation Bill was proposed in the New South Wales Parliament by a member of the Democratic Labor Party, a party of anti-communist Catholics. A Sydney Well member sent Josephine a telegram to say she was coming to Newcastle to do a radio interview on abortion reform. This shred of evidence shows that neither Josephine nor any other member of Well Newcastle felt capable of doing a public interview on the matter. The local Well group did write to the Newcastle member of the uh, Legislative Assembly, an MLA, expressing their alarm that the bill sought to bring back harsh penalties for women and doctors. Fortunately, the bill was allowed to lapse and the Democratic Labor Party man lost his seat in the next election. Josephine's first semi-public support of abortion was in December 1975 in a letter to the Journal of the New South Wales Nurses Association. All Christian churches have permitted abortion in the past, she wrote. England only passed anti-abortion laws in 1803 and Pope Pius IX decreed abortion was murder in 1869. Surely we must think it is better for women to have a safe hygienic abortion than to resort to backyard operators, knitting needles and crochet books again, crochet hooks again. This final plea became the theme for many of her letters and leaflets. In 1977, her first pro-choice letter to the Newcastle Morning Herald appeared in response to an earlier letter. She wrote to suggest that a young girl should have a baby because some people want to adopt babies 
sounds cruel and heartless. If women and girls have abortions, it is their business, not ours. Josephine was counteracting a common conservative argument at the time because after the court rulings and the Whitlam federal government's introduction of the supporting mother's benefit in 1973, there were fewer ava uh, babies available for adoption. Josephine also asserted that an abortion compared to bearing an unwanted child was the lesser of two evils. There were two rather hostile letters in response to which she re retorted that neither of the male writers showed any concern for the women as if they were non-existent. Why this fetish for the fetus, she asked. Analyst Rebecca Albury argues that anti-abortionists focused on the fetus because it rendered the woman invisible and of no account. The Australian Medical Association included procurement of abortion in the benefits list for the Medibank scheme introduced by the Whitlam government in 1975, which significantly increased affordability. The inclusion slipped past the notice, the right to life is, and was not attacked until 1977 under a federal coalition government. The health minister, Ralph Hunt, a member of what was then the country party, now the nationals, wanted the rules change so that the cost of abortions was only covered when medically necessary. That is, a woman's mental health and circumstances would not be taken into account. As well as lobbying against this proposal through well, Josephine had set up an activist group in her suburb of Waratah, which wrote to the 43 federal politicians in New South Wales, calling for a continuation of benefits. Their effort was a micro contribution to the onslaught of protest, and the government decided not to remove the item from the Medibank schedule. Josephine shored up her campaign efforts by forming a decades long collaboration with the Sydney Women's Abortion Action Campaign, WAC, a group that was established in several capital cities in the early 1970s. WAC's primary aims included abortion is a woman's right to choose. According to Albury, the phrase became one of the most well-known feminist slogans. This was undoubtedly because it had to be reiterated again and again. Another attack occurred in the House of Representatives in 1978 when Catholic member of the Right to Life, Stephen Lusher, Country Party, again sought to stop all medical benefits for abortion, except when the woman's life was in danger. Lusher proclaimed, if people have to pay more for abortions, I feel sorry, sorrier for the rich. Poor women have the advantage of having to stop and think. That is, they would have to think about whether they could afford a termination. Pro-choice activists rallied. Josephine's Waratah group collected signatures on a WAC petition and mailed out WAC broadsheets to women's groups, clubs, churches and hospitals all around New South Wales. How influential this type of um, scattergun campaigning was cannot be evaluated but Josephine believed it contributed to awareness raising and showed the recipients that legal abortions were widely supported. So the mail out was a tactic she employed many times. When Lush's motion was debated in parliament, no women's voices were heard because there were no women, mem no women members of the House of Representatives in those years. Pro-choice advocates were able to celebrate, however, when an amendment effectively defeated the motion. Battles for affordable access were not just happening in Australia. The International Campaign for Abortion Rights had been formed in London in 1978 and had member groups throughout the world. In 1979, they promoted an International Day of Action. It may have been then that Wendy McCarthy from Well in Sydney rang the Newcastle Well convener, Wendy Lindgren, to ask her to organise a march. Ling Lindgren reflected, I could no more do that than fly. I've always thought a woman should have the right to decide whether to have a baby or not, but to actually lead a march down Hunter Street in the 70s, it would have caused irreparable damage to relationships. 
more evidence of how difficult it was to go public on the issue. Slide, please. The Newcastle International Women's Day Committee, which Josephine had joined, decided to hold a march for the Day of Action. It was not successful. There were more police than the dozen or so marches, and Josephine carrying a placard was spat on by an angry man. It was counterproductive to bring a campaign to the streets when the numbers were embarrassingly low. So no more pro-choice marches were attempted in the city in those years. Instead, Josephine and her fellow activists occasionally joined the more populous marches in Sydney. In a 1980 Well National Bulletin, well, Cairns called for a nationwide well blueprint on action, on abortion, sorry, and Josephine for Well Newcastle suggested a leaflet with Australian news and statistics. Alerted to her interest, Ruth Schnuckel, a member of the Victorian Right to Choose Coalition, sent her a copy of their link, which emphasised abortion plus responsible parenthood equals happy families. Josephine and Ruth became pro-choice pen friends and a pathway of information exchange was laid down between Melbourne and Newcastle. Besides the Right to Life Association, another opponent in New South Wales was the reactionary Protestant, the Reverend Fred Nile, director of the Festival of Light, an anti-pornography, anti-homosexuality, anti-abortion organisation. And from 1981, a member of the New South Wales Legislative Council, an MLC, for his own call to Australia Party. In March 1982, Nile produced a private member's bill which would virtually outlaw abortion. Alarmed, Josephine and other women, including the Hunter region based Elizabeth Kirkby, an Australian Democrats MLC, founded the Right to Choose Abortion Coalition. Pro-choice campaigns often drew together people from a wide range of politics and the Raymond Terrace ALP subscribed, as did the more conservative East Maitland Country Women's Association. The regional organiser, the Democrats, also joined along with his wife. The coalition's first public meeting was held at the Newcastle Trades Hall and showing how heated the issue was. Police patrolled the entrance in case there was any trouble. The new group's aims were confirmed as the same as WAX, with the addition of Defeat the Nile Bill. Ten people attended the follow up meeting, not a lot, but they were all committed. Planning a vigorous campaign, they decided to produce and distribute 5,000 pro choice leaflets, and like any unfunded group would try to do, managed to get them printed for free. WAC, obviously pleased to have a connection with such an enthusiastic group, sent up yellow abortion information stickers to put on the backs of toilet doors. The Newcastle group began setting up regular stalls at the university, where Josephine stuck quite a few stickers in the toilets over the years. On one occasion, when she was alone at one of the uni stalls, a man in black leather jacket and boots came over and threatened her. I should kill you too, he said. My mother was rattled, but did not stop organising. The Right to Choose Coalition began placing succinct advertisements in local newspapers. Responses came from people wanting to help campaign, students with assignments, and anti-abortions, anti-abortionists. For example, a letter from father of three girls who aggressively asked, but what about the child's fucking rights? That may be too hard to, to read, but it's an interesting letter. A fourth type of response asked how to procure an abortion. Even in the more liberal environment, they could still be difficult to access. A woman from the low income enclave of Swansea Caravan Park wrote, my daughter who has just broken a violent de facto relationship now finds she is pregnant and is considering an abortion but like many others, does not know how or where to go about it. Her doctor will not help. Josephine gave considered replies to all the letters that had return addresses. In 1983, the Right to Choose Coalition sent out please rejoin letters declaring sisters 
we need more finance. The Democrats organised rejoin, but pointed out that the male members of his group were equally interested in and concerned about the rights of women to procure abortion. As well as joining, rejoining the Newcastle Family Planning Association staff, typed letters when asked and copied hundreds of pro-choice leaflets for the coalition. Other local organisations which joined include the Association of Women Employees of the University of Newcastle and the Women's Health Union. While some people have their own doctor or mechanic, Josephine, the perennial campaigner, had her own printer, which redesigned the WAC leaflets. When WAC later asked to use the Newcastle leaflets, the coalition paid for an update. It was an advantageous two-way collaboration. The Newcastle group mailed out the leaflets and petitions against Niall's motion to 360 mothers clubs around New South Wales. Signed petitions came back from, for example, the Housing Commission suburb of Windale. This was not just a middle-class issue. Statewide campaigning alerted the New South Wales government to community sensibilities and the Nile motion was never allowed a full debate in Parliament. International Women's Day was an opportunity for advocacy. Josephine usually carried a right to choose placard on the march. So one time, and one time she and a friend were jostled by two irate men. On another occasion, a man screamed out, go home and have children. Helen Brown, marching alongside my mother, yelled back, I have five already. Men who thought the women's only role was childbearing were still loudly vocalising their opinions. Because the lack of institutional resources was an acute constraint to pro-choice campaigning, the Right to Choose Coalition had to finesse their fundraising efforts. An early venture had been a barbecue, $3 entry, bring your own meat, and with wine, 50 cents a glass, and a crowded backyard of supporters, it was a huge success. Next, the Coalition had a film night with a documentary about a feminist-run abortion clinic. Only nine people turned up, a common occurrence at feminist films, as was the enthusiastic discussion afterwards. $35 was raised from entry and an ongoing raffle, but the hire of the film and project was $30. Even so, the coalition used it as a worthwhile nine. In 1985, jumping ahead, in 1985, Josephine heard on the pro-choice grapevine that Niall was going to introduce yet another private members bill. In reaction, the Right to Choose Coalition mounted a fundraising drive with a target of $2,000. An appeal for subscriptions and donations was featured in the WAC magazine and the World National Bulletin and sent to feminist groups all over Australia, most of which had limited money themselves. Because Newcastle had Dr Lang's clinic, the Coalition's energy could go into protests, whereas some groups were still trying to improve access for example, the Tasmanian Young Women's Refuge subscribed, but because there was no access for abortions for women without private medical insurance in their state, they wrote donations for their emergency fund would be gratefully received. In Newcastle, coalition members designed and produced a batch of T-shirts. They judged that shirts advocating abortion would not sell well, so took advantage of the numbers massing the peace marches in the mid-80s, and their designs included the women's symbol and stylized doves. They sold the shirts, badges, posters, books, and potted plants at stalls, fairs, and festivals, always giving out pro-choice literature and seeking support for the cause. By September 1986, the group had exceeded their target. They invested the money in term deposits, and when the rates rose under the Hawke-Keating government, they were getting 14% interest. This was used to fund advertisements on a request for pro-choice organisations around the state, and these appeared in the Sydney Morning Herald and Daily Telegraph, the Daily Liberal Gubbo, and the Goulburn Post. 
showing its conservatism, the Wagga newspaper refused to place the ad. Inflamed by Fred Nile's frequent appearances in the media, right to lifers were becoming more aggressive. When Josephine paid for an ad to appear in the Newcastle Post, even before the paper had come out, she began receiving abusive phone calls, so many she had to get a private, a silent number. More shockingly, a couple of months later, she was punched at a party by a man who had seen her pro-choice letters in the Herald. With no movement on Niles' bill, in October 86, his fellow call to Australia, MLC, Murray Bignall, put a motion on notice which called for the rights of the unborn child to be guaranteed in law. The Right to Choose Coalition distributed protest letters to be signed and sent to politicians and probably paid the postage for many of them. The letters varied for different politicians. The one to the New South Wales Premier, Premier included party political arguments for the first time. Abortion is an issue on which women who vote Labor will change their vote if a candidate promotes anti-choice policies, it said. Procedural tactics in June 1987 delayed debate on Big Noll's motion for a year. This meant ongoing activism. The Newcastle group mailed their usual package to addresses in the New South Wales Women's Directory and more groups subscribed, including six women's health centres, refuges in Glebe, Maruya and Almadal, women's information services in Lane Cove and Wollongong and the Sydney Rape Crisis Centre. The Right to Choose Coalition was generating wider and wider networks. They began inserting the image of a seven-week-old embryo in their mail-outs. The aim was to put the termination of an early-stage pregnancy into perspective by showing its minuscule size. They also included an image of a woman who had died from a botched abortion. When Josephine sent Bignall the literature, Bignold replied, you enclosed a picture of a woman left to die. That woman was a responsible and mature adult who made a decision to have an abortion. Big Nold in turn enclosed pictures of babies who she said had no choice in the matter. So now the protagonists were trading emotional images to argue their points. The second reading of Big Nold's motion in the Legislative Council was in June 1988, and, and this was passed with the support of the Catholic ALP leader of the council, proving the conservativeness of the New South Wales Upper House. However, the motion was never allowed discussion in the lower house. So Big Noll passed the baton back to Niall, who emerged later that month with a proposal for another bill which would have jailed women for up to three years for having an abortion. The Newcastle group responded with more advertisements. A passionate young woman from Charlestown wrote back, Anti-abortionists and maniacs like Reverend Fred Nile dare to dictate a right to life for an unborn, undeveloped fetus while taking away a woman or girl's right to her own life. If you could send, and more in that vein, if you could send me some information on how I can fight for women's rights, I hope I can help. Undoubtedly, she was sent all the paper. The Right to Choose Coalition began espousing the Votogram as an efficient way of campaigning. Josephine would give the text to a business called Voter Lobby, which would send telegrams to every member of selected Houses of Parliament. It cost a lot more than a mail-out, but saved labour, and there were now the funds to pay. The Coalition paid for Votograms for a number of local groups like Women in Education, Jenny's Place Women's Refuge, and the Workers' Centre. Former Olympic champion Dawn Fraser, member for Balmain, responded to a photogram, saying such a bill would be a backward step for society. Josephine's group gave financial help to the Abortion Rights Coalition, a national group, to produce protest po postcards and orchestrated the signing and sending of hundreds, if not thousands, of the cards from groups and individuals Nile was surprised by the strength of the campaign against his bill 
and withdrew it because he did not have the support he needed. WAC declared this their first ever real, first real pro-choice campaign victory. One analyst has observed that successful feminist intervention require a coalition of grassroots feminists, national women's organisations, and feminist friendly allies. The grassroots Newcastle group was one cop in this well-oiled intervention. Before the Nile Mill was withdrawn, a New South Wales Liberal had begun gauging support for a private members bill to restrict abortions to a limited number of hospitals. The anguished lament to the barricades again and again, and yet again, expressed the feeling of all campaigners. The Right to Choose Coalition collaborated with WAC to mail out petitions to a selection of private citizens in all New South Wales electorates and organised form letters for politicians using a range of well thought out arguments. Clover Moore, independent MLA for Bly, responded, I believe it to be the most destructive proposal. Women have the right to control their own lives and make decisions about their bodies. Women's right of control was now firmly embedded in the discourse and the private member's proposal was never debated in Parliament. During all these campaigns, Josephine ensured that the coalition um, formed and maintained connections around Australia. She corresponded with groups in Sydney and Melbourne and received their publications, as well as the newsletter from Children by Choice in Queensland. When she subscribed to the newsletter of the Western Australian Association for the Legal Right to Abortion, she included an account of Newcastle activism. The editor thought that it was really great to know about the purchase choice people in other states and to shrink the distance between them. In 1987, when Children by Choice's funds were drying up, forced them, forcing them to consider the closure of their counselling service, Contributions from the US and all over Australia gave them reprieve. Josephine's group was one of the contributors. The following year, the Newcastle group donated $1,000 to the Abortion Rights Coalition, which was extremely grateful as their bank balance was zero after having produced and distributed fact sheets. In 1989, the Right to Choose Coalition sent a generous donation towards the cost of a full page advertisement in the West Australian calling for decriminalisation of abortion in that state, which drew 900 letters of support. The fundraising efforts of the Newcastle Group were paying national dividends. The battles continued. In May 1989, the independent Tasmanian Senator and Catholic, Brian Harradine, proposed a bill which would once again try to stop Medicare payments for abortions. The Right to Choose Coalition was just one of many groups which collected signatures on a WAC petition stating, Medicare cannot pretend to be a universal health system without providing a rebate for a termination of pregnancy. Because of the speediness and strength of protests, the bill was not given time for debate. Politicians had been made well aware of how the majority of voters felt. Josephine had a particular interest in the USA because her son was working there. And on her visits, she had been in touch with the American Right to Choose campaign. In November 1989, there was a possibility that the US Supreme Court would overturn the 1973 benchmark case Roe versus Wade, which had legalized abortion on a federal level and invalidated state laws. In, the, in solidarity, the Newcastle Coalition faxed the National Organisation for Women in Washington, D.C. We are very concerned that the USA, which should be in the vanguard of rights for women, is becoming more conservative. It ended with, we support you in all your actions fighting for rights. WAC organised a picket in solidarity with their American sisters at the US consulate in Sydney, which the Newcastle group helped advertise and attended. With a five to four majority, the US Supreme Court voted to uphold a Missouri law 
which placed restrictions on abortions. But importantly, one judge declared his vote was not to be used to overturn Roe versus Wade. My mother would have been very distressed to see it overturned this year. But on an optimistic note, when women rallied in Australian cities over concern that the Supreme Court decision would have a domino effect, 600 people rallied in Newcastle, a vast improvement on the dozen marches back in 1979. New generations of women are not prepared to lose the hard-won access. To conclude, in the 1970s and 1980s, Pro-choice groups around Australia had to fight battle after battle against church-based members of parliament in the long and nasty war to main access, maintain access to pregnancy terminations. The Right to Choose Abortion Coalition in Newcastle, led by my courageous mother, Josephine Conway, helped create and participate in networks between those groups, networks for campaigning, information exchange and funding support locally and interstate. The right to life as we held at bay because of the effectiveness of these networks. And this case study, this talk has illustrated the importance of regional groups in pro-choice campaigning specifically and more generally in changing social views. Thank you. Mm, great. Fantastic. Thank you. That was a really fascinating uh, paper and a really interesting glimpse into you know, a, a side of Newcastle history that I, I must confess I wasn't as familiar with as I ought to be. Uh, can I throw that uh, the, the, the open for questions? Mm. Uh, perhaps I might start. Uh, I was really curious about your mother's decision to send letters to church, broadsheets to churches, given so much of the opposition seemed to come from churches. But then it occurred to me, perhaps I'm being presumptuous, and perhaps some of the churches were more open to this idea. You made the point that church opposition to abortion is a very specific historical period. Yeah. Were there ever any positive responses from church organisations? Um, she, uh, they hardly got any responses. Um, they didn't get any positive. They did get uh, uh, the Presbyterian Church in Weewall wrote back to say that abortion was killing, was killing of a human being, you know, and would never be right. So, no, they, they, sent, they sent letters to a very broad, they sent it to sporting clubs, workers' clubs, a whole range of places, not even just women's groups. So I think, uh, yeah, the idea was... I would assume just to show a broad range of places, including churches. So I, I was just saying, okay, churches, this is what's happening. This is what we believe. So I don't think they're expecting positive feedback. No. Right, I see. Um, so we've got uh, several hands up, but I'll first uh, just go over the question we got on the text uh, from uh, Linda Ryan. Is it possible to get an abortion in Newcastle today? Ah, uh, yes. It's, um, I think it's in Bright Meadow. Um, yeah, there's, there's in Broadmeadow where you can get um, a, an abortion and I believe there's a law that prevents people um, protesting in the vicinity of, um, I don't know whether that's a federal or state law, but uh, pre prevents people protesting out front, which happened for many years. Um, there's a whole story that I didn't include because of the time about Loch Lachlan Lang closing his clinic in 1989 um, because of um, one woman who changed her mind um, afterwards and said he hadn't counselled her enough and he, she took him to court. And he had suffered so much um, um, criticism from other gynaecologists and, and Newcastle or community, he decided to close his clinic. So there was actually no, people had to go to Sydney between 1989 and 1994 when the first um, Planned Parenthood uh, clinic opened. Fascinating. Um, uh, Nancy. Thanks so much, Jude. Lovely to hear all this coming together after having read many draft chapters of your thesis and so on. So congratulations on being able to, to bring it into public forum. Um, and maybe this is a little bit of a Dorothy Dixer, but 
Um, you, you drew out in particular that this was not just a middle class issue. And I know that that's something that mm. sort of infused your research. I just wondered if you could talk a little bit more about that in terms of abortion in particular. Uh, well, I didn't um, expand on, on when I made that statement, but in the what I call the critical 1990s, you know, postmodern critical 1990s, when feminists were uh, the second wave women's movement was berated as being, you know, only concerned about middle class issues. Um, I, I, I wanted to emphasize that uh, the right to have an abortion and to have an affordable abortion and a, a pregnancy termination was a really important um, aspect of the second wave women's movement and, you know, the, the, the constancy of the struggles to maintain it as a Medicare rebate, for example, and um, so and the, you know, the petition coming back, at the end from Windell, you know, there, there were numerous, um, you know, there's numerous proof that abortion in particular was a an issue to uh, women at all, all levels of society. So I was just throwing in that little comment um, <laughs> to uh, you know to say that I don't agree with that critical 1990s view that the second wave women feminists were only you know middle class and only concerned about their middle class issues or their own issues. And I mean, in my mother's case, for example, she, she was middle class, but I mean, she had certainly had no reason to support abortion for her own use. I mean, she was postmenopausal <laughs> when all this um, activity was happening. And, you know, the, the lesbian um, newsletter in Newcastle, No Frills, were also, you know, promoting, saying, come and get your petitions, you know, against the Nile Bill. I mean, there were many, there was you know, lots of concern about rights for all women at that time. So mm. all Great. women of all classes at that time. Thank you. I think it's important work, an important point to keep making. Yes. Uh, Barbara. Uh, thank you. Um, thanks, Jude. That was fabulous presentation. I think it's really... Um, new and really important to do this kind of regional history of abortion activism. I've got two questions. And on that point, it seems from your account that the Newcastle group was much more than a regionally focused group. They were kind of in collaboration with WAC in Sydney, really New South Wales wide and even national. So do you, is, is that a fair assessment of their, their scope and their work and their impact? Well, um, I like to think so. Um, uh, the reason I was stressing the importance of uh, regional histories is that they tend to be left out of, um, you know, Australian women's movement histories. And, you know, that's one thing I argued in my thesis on the Newcastle women's movement and, and mentioned in this talk, that um, they were important not only in what they did locally. And, of course, I mean, there were no thing, there was no major things happening in Newcastle that, uh, you know, Parliament wasn't in Newcastle. Uh, we had at least had Lockie Lang, as he was known um, locally. And um, so, yes, they had to act on a broader front than just, you know, what was useful for Newcastle. So all their actions and all their collaborations were Australia-wide. I, I just had contact with, you know, WAC still exists and they're, they're still sorting out all their papers and, I had contact with someone through Messenger the other day from WAC and she said, oh, yes, your mother's name is always coming up. So, I, you know, I haven't seen all their files and that'll be a great um, resource once I do because that um, I know I have seen a copy of a letter between WAC, Sydney WAC, and Rue Schnuckel in Victoria. So the whole point of these networks, and I, there may well be other regional groups that were involved as well, which I don't know about because they haven't been mentioned in the histories um, that were in, in those Australia-wide networks. And it was those networks that were able to change the views of society, I think, and battle against those conservative politicians. Because when you think that, you know, pre, say, 1969, I mean, abortion was illegal. It was, and, and people didn't talk about it. They, you know, it was kept, it was under... Raps, it was backyard, it was, and by 
you know, the women's movement and the networks that were there were that consisted of capital cities and regional groups was was so strong in in forcing that change in in social accept, acceptability. And when you look at the six hundred women that rallied in you, I was so impressed. So you know, I think regional groups need to be um, included in all histories where, where, when they can. I mean, you've got to you know you've got to tap into the papers and of course. Can I ask another question? Sure, Barbara. I may not have even answered what you wanted me to answer. <laughs> if, I can't see all the whole the whole people on the screen, but if there's no one else, and it goes to that 600 people who marched in Newcastle in, in 1989, I think, in relation to the Supreme Court um, issue in the United States. I've been really interested in the response in Australia in the last few weeks about the overturning of, or the response to the overturning of the Roe versus Wade ruling by the Supreme Court in the United States. And um, it, it, I went to the rally in, in South Australia that was organised by young people and, to me, predominantly young people in attendance. And it, it, and there were others of us who'd worked on the abortion campaign in South Australia who were a little bit miffed because there were 5,000 people there protesting against the overturning of Roe versus Wade. And we, in a South Australia, in our campaign, had had hundreds which was fabulous. But it's really interesting to hear there's this history of, to me, extraordinary response to the United States, but kind of out of all proportion to its significance and sometimes kind of not, not what one might hope would also be there for local issues. And I just found those 600 people marching in Newcastle in 1989 a fascinating history of this interest and response to US politics. Um, I just want to correct um, that. The 600 were rallied in, in this year. It wasn't 600 in 1989. In 1989, the Newcastle activists went down and joined the Sydney protest outside the US consulate. No, the 600, that was that what I was saying. Mum, was, mum would have been in distress. My late mother would have been distressed about the overturning this year. And, but on an optimistic note, the 600 that rallied this year in Newcastle compared to um, you know, back back in, I, I headed to the 1979 march of about a dozen marches. But, I mean, I also have the same uh, feeling of view is, you know, why is so much um, notice taken of America uh, and, and the US Supreme Court? So I, I could only imagine it was concern about a domino effect um, other than just our, you know, a more always taking more note of what happens in America than, than what happens um, locally. So, um, yeah, my feeling is that it must be concerned about the domino effect. But I think in Mum's, the facts that the Newcastle group sent in um, 1989, sent to the America, the National Organisation of Women, that it started with, you know, you would expect America to be in the vanguard of, of you know, of progressivism, I guess. And I think that was the shock then and the and the you know and how much they were upset then by um, by what happened in America and I think that probably still applies today. We still would think that America and women in America had access to legal abortions, you know, that and would be in the forefront in the world. But you know, supposedly a progressive society, um, but yeah. Uh, exactly why so much notice was taken of America. Well, you, you may have more to say about that, Barbara, than me. I'm sure there'd be lots of people could, could look at that issue. Okay, other questions? I was wondering if you could say something a bit about the opposition um, in terms of in the anecdotes you, you, you gave or that your, your mother seems to have uh, uh, reported, uh, the opposition seems overwhelmingly male. And that makes a lot of sense, right? But was there also female opposition? And oh, yes, yes. Did you have to deal with that as well? Yes, there was female opposition. Um, well, Mari Bignold, for example. Mm. There, there was, um, I mean, a lot of um, fundamental Christian women mm -hmm. um, were against... Um, uh, having abortions. So yes, 
but it certainly seems to me when I looked at letters, you know, I went through 20 years of Newcastle Morning Heralds, um, a lot of the anti-abortion uh, letters were from men. Um, no women jostled my mother mm. or punched my mother or... Um, but maybe some of the threatening phone calls, uh, actually when she put the ad in the Newcastle Post and started receiving threatening phone calls, well, she paid for that and, and, and gave her, you know, her payment was given to a, a woman uh, a receptionist at the Newcastle Post and who would have had access to her phone number. Right. So, you know, no, there were, there were um, women, but not as many and not as obviously. I mean, the male protest was so obvious, and so out there and, and so often, you know, loud and physical. Um, and, you know, I, I just mentioned briefly, I mean, this is more a practical, you know, talk rather than um, a narrative, rather than a the theory. But, you know, the women's movement did, did, did consider that the male sort of, it was all about power in, in the long run. It was about male power over women, ch church and state, and male power over women. And it was something mum wrote, you know, and women... And from women who think as men do, she wrote, um, you know, think that men should have power over women and not having, uh, being able to control your own fertility um, was one aspect of, um, of that male power over women. Fascinating. Are there other questions? Um, sorry, uh, Kate Till Spicer. So this is such an amazing topic, uh, such an interesting topic, and so amazing what your mum did. I was just wondering in terms of your research, looking at the public response, did you also examine newspapers or was there also news footage? Uh, there was no, no, there was no, I, I haven't really gone through the local news footage. Uh, what I have seen that's, you know, they're starting to digitise it now, but um, I don't think there was news footage of the dozen or so marches. <laughs> I mean, NBN3, our local television, um, did not uh, uh, pay much attention to the Newcastle women's movement, I can assure you. Um, even colourful International Women's Day marches were rarely covered. Um, yeah, I haven't... I, I, I believe there's... But... There is an interview by John Church, who was who was formerly with NBN3, with Lock, Lachlan Lang, and there's a copy of it in the Jesse Street um, National Women's Library. And I haven't uh, I haven't actually watched, listened through it. It's probably on an old videotape. I, I must talk to Jesse Street and ask them to um, to make sure it's digitised because I think it's probably a really important um, piece of history. And I would imagine that that may well be an, a, a Channel 3, um, you know, the Newcastle station, that that well may have been an interview on TV because it was a big thing when he closed his clinic and the Newcastle Herald, the, the journalist was Jack Greg Ray, um, you know, did an extensive interview with, with Lachlan Lang which um, in, in, was in that interview where he reflected back to when he'd opened the clinic at Newcastle Hospital and how, I mean, and also the reason that um, the clinic became unwieldy was actually the hospital board's fault because they, you know, oh, you have to get permission from this person and that person. They made it unwieldy and then used that as an argument to, you know, close it down. Um, yeah, so there's that interview there. <laughs> but other than that, I don't know about anything from the local television station. But, I mean, abortion was actually quite a popular topic in, new, in newspapers. They obviously found that it, um, you know, it sold, uh, sold a number of copies because, you know, whenever Bertram Weiner in Victoria, who was, you know, one of the early campaigners on abortion reform, corruption of police, um, you know, changes in, in laws and court rulings, I mean, that did actually receive quite a lot of coverage in the, in the newspapers. But as far as local campaigning, I mean, that, you know, the Newcastle Herald didn't know what was going on behind the scenes with the Newcastle right to choose abortion coalition and from that first public meeting 
you know, there was a tiny, there was a tiny little article with a little picture of um, Elizabeth Kirkby, a tiny little article in the paper. Um, so, you know, I didn't get much out of the Newcastle Herald. As far as general reporting on abortion campaigning, um, you know, the Tribune, the Communist Party Tribune, and, and of course, you know, the WAC had a magazine uh, called the Right to Choose, but the Communist Party, the Tribune, was the best um, newspaper coverage of abortion campaign, uh, campaigning in support of the Right to Choose in those years. I know that the uh, Living Histories has got a lot of the TV footage um, digitised. Currently, I've only used it lightly because obviously something completely un unrelated. It seems quite easy to search, though, so you might well find material. Oh, I have, I, I have looked through it. Um, you know, I'm on there. Um, sure. I subscribe to there, and they get, and I rarely see anything to do with the women's movement. Sure. Or all those issues, rarely, really. But, um, you know, who knows? <laughs> Surely. Um, we seem to have a slight malfunction with the Zoom where everybody's hand or nearly everybody's hand is appearing as, as, as up. So I don't actually know whether we've got other people waiting to ask uh, uh, questions or not. So yes, Barbara, please. If I can come back and, and really this is going back to the regional issue. I mean, and I've, I find this very exciting, actually. It, it's just a comment. I was really interested to hear, and if I'm correct in my note taking in 1986, um, the Newcastle Group paid for advertisements in many New South Wales papers, but the Wagga newspaper refused to place the ad. That's really interesting because in recent years, if not exactly today, Wagga has been a terrible place for abortion provision um, with really, you know, strong anti-abortion doctors at the Wagga hospital. So that's interesting to know that's got a long history um, with the newspaper back in the 80s. That was just, I'm just making, drawing the drawing the, the dot, the li linking the dots, which is, you know, exciting. Yes. Um, the, that campaign, uh, the offer from the Right to Choose Abortion Coalition in Newcastle to those groups wasn't just, it started in 1986 after, the, you know, they started getting high interest rates and, and um, getting, you know, good interest on the, on the money they raised. Um, that went on until the end of the decade, actually. Um, and and the, uh, the ads wouldn't appear just once. They'd usually appear three times a week for, for four weeks. So, and, and, you know, it'd just be very tiny little ads uh, with a contact post office box. There, there was never a phone number put in, in the public ad, which is why, you know, when mum started receiving phone calls after the, putting the ad in the post, I mean, the only people that would know the phone call was the person working in the office. And, and um, but yeah, no, I just so I just say that campaign went on. So obviously, uh, when I said I wasn't sure about how um, how much networking was done, well, I mean, there was obviously there was networking done with other re regional um, groups because of the number of people that subscribed. Um, to the, to the Newcastle group. I mean, they came from all over, you know, Armadale, Marua. I know, Mum, it wasn't mentioned in today's talk, but she she had regular contact with the Lismore Women's Group. And um, she, uh, so, you know, they would have had contact with a number of groups all, all throughout New South Wales um, in particular. So I don't know, and Adelaide didn't come up at all in, in my notes, um, Barbara, so I'm not sure. I assume there was a newsletter coming out of Adelaide, but, um, I, you know, if, if the Newcastle group subscribed, I didn't see any evidence of that. Um, Barbara, if, um, if, you know, any of my uh, files or, or notes, you know, you're very welcome. I, I know I've... I've seen, you know, your work. I mean, I actually find the literature, the, the literature, academic literature, on right to juice campaigns is fairly sparse, I think, relatively to other areas. Of course, I've read everything that you've written, well, a number of things that you've written, but I would like to say, you know, if you want to have access to any of my files, you're, you're totally welcome. Or you wanted to co-write an article. I always get help because I find, uh, you know, I'm not a real theorist and I always find it difficult to um, write academic articles, <laughs> but I can provide narratives. It's been absolutely fascinating, um, uh, 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 fascinating narrative. Uh, we have come up to the... Uh,
uh, end of the uh, hour. So please uh, join me in thanking Jude again for an absolutely fascinating paper. Really, really interesting. Just before you go, I just want to mention that our next seminar will be on Friday, the 2nd of September, as part of New South Wales History Week. Our speaker, uh, Jasper Ludwig, from uh, architecture at the University of Newcastle will be addressing the topic, the architecture of the global Moravian network uh, between 1720 and uh, 1920. Until then, thank you all and have a great weekend. Yeah.